No, so, so what I recently found out was that there's, there's this National Institute of Play, and it's created by this guy named Dr. Stuart Brown. And he actually worked with the USTA early on in developing like quick start tennis or early okay. adoptions of progressions and teaching and the teaching of play. Like the the idea of when when you're you know when you're coaching tennis or you're right. looking to coach tennis, um, tennis is a game. And if we forget that we're we're trying to learn to play a game and not perfect a stroke. Right? Right. Like so anything you anything you start as far as a sport, if you're coaching a sport, you have to look at there's like basically seven steps to becoming a higher performance player or to become a better player and the, the first thing is you've got to teach the skill you've got to learn the skill as a player so and the second thing is learning it well learn that skill very well okay so there requires repetition and things like that and, and your the time that you have to devote to learning that skill is going to depend a lot on your schedule and, and your commitment level, but not only that, that's going to determine the amount of time you spend will determine how well you can learn the skill. So, but then you start getting into, okay, you've learned the skill well um, at speed, like at real speed, right. so not this delay speed, right? So you've got to actually learn it at the speed of the game or in real time. So serve, return, play out the point in real time, yeah. right? Then at, once you are, are doing it at speed, then under fatigue, when you're tired, when you're tired mentally, emotionally, right. and physically, you've got to be able to perform the skill well at speed um, in real, um, sorry, uh, under fatigue. Then you add pressure. The pressure of what? Like the pressure of scoring. Like, scorekeeping in sport brings pressure. If you're not keeping score, then there really isn't a, pr there, there isn't a lot of pressure yeah. there. It's yeah. more of a participation right. situation instead of a performance situation. Because when, there's a, when score, the score is being kept, there's winning and losing now. There's a winner and there's a loser. And then we think of ourselves as a winner or a loser. And so it starts to play with our minds, our mental capacity, our emotional capacity to handle that, right? So how do you respond to winning and losing is really important to determine how far you're going to be able to be a competitor, right. a performance player or a better player. We all want to get better at sport, but if we not, we don't practice under pressure. So under fatigue, at speed, under fatigue, under pressure, okay? And then you've got to think about um, doing that over and over and over again so consistently performing the skill well at speed under fatigue while you're tired under pressure of scorekeeping and you've got to do it over and over and over and over again then the last step is and problem solve right so you do all those things, and then you look to solve problems. Why are you solving problems? So you can win. Because ultimately, if you're keeping score, you're trying to win. And the only way you do that is solve problems. So when I started to think about in 2012, when I was working with the team yeah. you played on, and now you're going to coach, okay, which is a yeah, full circle, it's right? It's crazy, right? So I'm helping you look at coaching now instead of coaching you as a player, now you're going to be doing what I was doing. Right. So what I suggest is take my advice based on what I learned those years. Okay. Um, there's three things that make a great coach. Number one, they love the sport. Like they love coaching. Yeah. They love coaching, right? And for several reasons. The, the loving to coach uh, will get you through the tough times when things aren't going so great. Maybe your team is losing or your, your message isn't getting across to that player for whatever reason. Uh, you know, a lot. Sometimes it has to do with the way you're communicating it. 
um, or the way they're receiving it, or maybe they had a bad day, or you, know, you just didn't prepare. You're trying too hard, maybe, or you're not trying enough. So there's a lot of different things that go on there. There's a lot of things you got to think through, and I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you think through those things. The second thing that makes a great coach is they listen. They listen to their players, not just with their ears, like what's coming out of their mouth. But they're looking and listening. They're watching. They're observing. Right. So there's so many times like I would have y'all go do things, and I would retreat up to the perch. Right. Right. And I would look. And when I was looking, I was listening. I was listening. I was looking at your body, everybody's body language, and I was trying to listen to what the message they were sending out. Right. Maybe it looked like they were just having a tough time. Well, maybe they had a tough day. So I asked you about your day. How was your day? And a lot of tests today, or. Do you have tests coming up, or like, what's going? You know, how are you doing? Yeah. You know, any issues with friends? Uh, like, there may be some things that are carrying over into practice that is just inhibiting you from being a better performer in practice. So, listening, you know, a great coach who listens to their athlete, and they listen to themselves, like how they're presenting, and they listen for feedback from maybe. Uh, they, you, you ask someone's advice, or you ask someone to observe you coaching, right? Yeah. And then give you feedback. Um, so you listen to that feedback, and you make adjustments. Um, then you listen to how your message is being interpreted, right? So you, maybe with the best intentions, you're trying to deliver a message about how to go, how to do about do something. But they're just not getting it. Well, it could be either maybe you need to present it in a different way. Maybe you need to tell a story that that they can engage in the story, and then you can teach the, the skill through a story, right? Because we all would love to hear stories. That's why I used to tell a lot of stories. Yeah. <laughs> you crazy stories, yeah. right? As I used to talk about homeless people and the story. You know, when I used to, you know visit homeless people on the side of the road. Uh -huh. But I would relate it to something eventually back into tennis really quickly because right. I didn't want to bore you because I wanted you to think, well, why is he telling me this? What, do we have, what does it have to do with tennis? <laughs> well, so I would get there quickly. Right? Yeah. Um, and so you to get the message across, you use storytelling. Um, the third thing is that a great coach does is they are constantly learning. They're learning about how to be a better coach. They're learning from other coaches. They're learning from the environment of the practice. Okay, I went through this, and this really worked, and this bombed. Well, it's not maybe because that challenge wasn't a good challenge, you know, or, or a, 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 a good play, uh, a good game right. you know, that you played. Maybe it's the way, maybe it's where you put it in the practice. Maybe instead of putting it in the middle, maybe you should have put it in the beginning. Or maybe instead of waiting to the end to play the game, play it at the beginning. Maybe everybody came out, they're kind of flat. So play a game. Yeah. I did that tons of times, right? Uh, you, all you guys would come out and you're like, you know, I could tell you were just you know, moping around or you just kind of you know, goofing off. Like they want to goof off. Let's play a game, but let's. But I structured it so you actually learn skills. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's a way to pull players in without, you know, trying to draw, you know, bring out Thor's hammer, <laughs> you know, and you don't do what I say. Run. Yeah, yeah. How, what, how does that help the situation? So uh, if it starts raining a little bit more, I have to put the top up. Okay. But no worries. Um, so yeah. So like so. They love coach. They love coaching or the experience. For what? Because they love it. Because they understand that what they're doing cannot just change someone's tennis game. You could say something or do something that could change their life. You know, for for the better or for the worse. So that's why you've got to be. You've got to be. That's why you got to listen. You know, and not just give forth what you want to happen. Like you, you bring something to the table because you're bringing it so they can learn. And then if they're not learning or something's breaking down, 
you know, it's maybe it's the process, maybe it's the preparation, maybe it's how you deliver. Right. right. So, um, and then you know, the players get to know you through the process. Like you've got to give time for them to get to know you. Like your personality is not like mine. Yeah. I mean, I'm. Yeah. Like I can be really out there. Right. You know, really. You know. Colorful, passionate. Right. Engaging, you know, to the point where I actually like people are like get away from it, right? And then some just love that. They love to embrace that. They want someone with energy. So then, and then you have, but find the balance and all that. Like there were days that I had to be, I was more mellow on purpose. Is because I wanted to give forth this different perspective. I wanted to give um, people the idea that I wasn't just one dimensional in my expression. That I can actually calm down. And, that and so, but you have a perspective of Sterling, yeah, how I coached you, right? right? So, you you see how I was able to get results and fast results, right? And it, it was not necessarily my flamboyant personality and passion, you know, it was really how I went about the process of keeping my perspective of loving co to coach, listening, and learning. And, and, and doing that every day, right? right? So I would say that the strongest message is the one that can be delivered in the simplest way. So if you can deliver the message in a very simple way, that is your, that's the strongest message, right? Even Albert Einstein said, if you can't teach something simply, you don't know it well enough, right? right. And so I've spent all of my adult life trying to simplify my message and the way you do that is you got to know what you're talking about and so there has to be a lot of learning and, and that's why I'm so glad you reached out to me because like you can you can jump start your coaching by learning from someone who made all the mistakes and, went, and, and knows I know the road that you can take that's going to get you there faster Right. And you don't have to take this whole winding road, yeah. you know, up and down mountains and valleys, and right. like me, right? right? And I had some mentors that helped me, but I'm an, I like to figure it out myself, right? I, I enjoy the process of learning and the journey of learning, right? I, I, I just, I, I'm not a big guy on quick fixes, although I, I like things that work fast. I'm not a quick fix, fix kind of guy. I just don't think that way. I think there's a process to things. I think you can get to things faster if you do it efficiently. Um, so, so I'm going to help you navigate and get there faster. Um, one of the things that you want to think about is you're going to spend more time in practices with these guys than you are matches. The matches are just their time to do their thing. You can't, uh, there's nothing you can really say to a player during a match that's good, like the magic bullet that's yeah. going to keep them from like coming from way behind forward. Now, sometimes I've seen it happen. Like sometimes I would say something and it literally was the magic bullet. Like something I said triggered in their brain and they went, Oh yeah, but that was because we had worked on it for a long time before that moment. Right. So it'd been stirring up inside of them, yeah, yeah. and it was like the straw that broke the camel's back. It was like I said one thing, and it went ding, epiphany. But that's because we worked on it, right? right? So it wasn't something just like out of the air, and it just worked. No, it was. I always would say things that we've been working on repeatedly over time. Cause see. We, we have, as, as human beings, we have thick skulls, right? So that we want to think we know it all. And that's great. That's a, that's, you want to be confident. But really, we have thick, thick heads, right? <laughs> things have to be, go, oh, you know, we, do, we go through the same things all the time and still don't learn the lesson. Yeah. And so, uh, or we go through different situations and trying to learn the same lesson. Right. Right? So you don't learn it in this lesson. Well, I'll give you something that looks completely new, but it's the same lesson. Pay attention. Be patient.
Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you're dealing, you understand you have your most of your time is with practice. So your preparation should be for the practice. And because because out of the practice, that's the preparation for the match. So in other words, the practices should look very and feel similar to what that player will experience in a match. So let's go back to the seven things. What you do in practice, you should keep scoring. Whatever you're doing. Because scorekeeping has to do with winning and losing, and that's what they're going to experience in a match. other thing is whatever you do in practice will that actually happen in a match like you know you don't see a lot of players volleying 10 balls back and forth in a match very long right. during a point maybe once in a blue moon now the reason why you maybe would start out with them trying to volley 10 is is for is to build a skill of being able to control the speed of the ball right. or be able to like make sure they're in a good ready position receiving a volley in other words so if i was going to have them we would do a warm-up where we'd volley 10 and 10 forehands each other and 10 backhands that's just to develop eyes get your eyes and your feet engaged and be able to control the speed of the ball right, right? and then you move back now, can we control a rally from the service line? All right? Can we control the speed of the ball and the spin of the ball and the height and the direction? Then I move you back and we hit. But notice we didn't spend a lot of time in that. Like we we spent a few minutes volleying, a few minutes from mini tennis or short court. What I call short court, I hate mini tennis. Like I hate that mini word because we think, oh, I'm a baby. <laughs> short court. Okay. Right? So I changed the word because I want it to, to sound more. You know, accept. You know, you accept it. Yeah. Um, little kids were going to play mini tennis. They're like, "Oh yeah, mini tennis." You know, it's great. Uh, but for you know, adults or young young adults like yourself, just say, "Hey, we're going to do some short court today." Yeah. Play on a short court. Then we play on you know uh, the long court. Um, then you you know, go right into a scenario. Maybe like we played Stinger. Remember the Stinger? Where we have, it's a doubles, where you have, yeah. I would feed the ball like a, a, a fluff second serve, and they would sting it cross court and come in. And then so the receiving team was kind of one up, one back, and the stinging team was the re receiving, or sorry, they were the serving team, so receiving and coming in, so they were putting pressure. So it was all about, getting two players to come into the net and play the net in doubles yeah. against a one-up, one-back scenario because that's that's a big advantage. Yeah, yeah. And, and it happens in a game, and you want to get players overcoming the fear of, of getting a short ball. You want them to hit it and come in. You don't want them to run forward, hit it, and run and retreat. Right. Retreat, yeah. right? That's – you're going to – then it gets into two singles players – no, sorry, two players playing singles – during a doubles match. Two people in the net are just watching the ball go back and forth. Yeah, that's not doubles. So just remember like your practices, keeping score, and you're doing, you're going through scenarios in practice that they're going to experience in match play. So playing silly games that don't have anything to do with keeping score or winning or, or a winner or a loser, or that is, doesn't look like what they might experience in a match is useless. Like the game butts up. You know, everybody puts their butt up and you try to hit them in the butt. That's the dumbest crap ever invented by some non-tennis coach. Okay? Or if it was invented by a tennis coach, they just weren't thinking, in my opinion. A, you, somebody can get hurt really bad. And B, it just doesn't have anything to do with playing the game. It has to do with horsing around. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I believe in having fun. I'm like, I'm the number one proponent of fun. Let's have fun and play. But shenanigans? No. You just, as a coach, you don't want to have the responsibility of someone getting hurt on your court yeah. doing something idiotic and stupid. Right? And that's all going to be on you. When it all comes back to it, the parents, the AD, even the players yeah. are going to go, oh, the coach let us do it. See, it's always see? Right. the buck stops here. So you, you have to look at things as everything's your fault. If something goes wrong, it's all your fault. So if you do that, it's very freeing because you take on the responsibility. So then you go into the situation where um, we're going to have fun. We're going to keep things within certain parameters because these parameters are going to make us a better player and a better human being. Right. Um, someone's having a bad day. It's, there's a reason. There's a reason. So put them in a situation where they can sort of you know, break free of that frustration, temptation, struggle, you know, anger. <laughs> Put them in a situation that's playful. Play relieves you of stress, right? I mean, you think about it in your own life when you're really stressful, and you're like, the heck with it, I'm just going to go play. I'm just going to go play tennis, I'm going to go play golf, I'm going to go play with my friends, Ultimate Frisbee, I'm going to go play video games, I'm going to go play at watching a movie, like anything, yeah. right? Because it relieves the stress. So think about that in terms of tennis and a practice. What can you do in practice to change the tone or the vibe of practice? Maybe it's going downhill, or maybe it's just getting out of hand. You gotta reel it in yeah. to bring a little bit more structure. And I'll give you some I'll give you some great examples of games and challenges that you can play and how you can organize it in time, in real time. Like from this time to this time, you do this. From this time to this time. If you saw my coach's notes, it was all written down. And then I gave room to creativity and to flip-flopping. I was very flexible because I believe that. Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be broken. So you have to be flexible. Yeah. All right? Or you're going to break. So yeah, so I'm going to help you go through that process okay. where you go in, you have a plan, and I highly recommend going and getting like like a composition notebook. And every day you document your practices, right? You have a you have a plan of what you're doing minute by minute. You have your water breaks put in there, and you have your watch, and you're keeping tabs. You know, you do. I use the stopwatch. So when we start an activity, if it was if it was ten minutes, I set my clock for eight. Okay. Because I wanted to I wanted to give flexibility to the time. So just in case we got to eight minutes and they still needed to play an extra point, I still had two minutes left. Right. Preparation and execution. It's the only two things you need to be successful. I'll say that again. Preparation and execution is the only two things you need to be successful in anything, right? So the better you prepare yourself, the better you build in flexibility, the more, the more you're, the better you're going to execute that and your players are going to execute it. And therefore that's going to lead ultimately to success, okay? Now remember, success can be defined in many ways. It's not just winning and losing on the scoreboard. It's winning and losing inside. Did I walk? Did your players leave the practice court and have a good time? And did they learn some things about themselves? Right. And did they learn how to be a better teammate, a better player, a better loser, a better winner? Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's your goal as a coach is for them to leave that practice inspired, motivated, sometimes frustrated. Yeah, it's okay for them to leave practice frustrated because hopefully that frustration will motivate them to come back and be better. Now, you don't want them to leave angry, 
you know, being frustrated and being angry are two completely different things. Anger is a whole other level of frustration, right? So you don't want to leave them angry and, and you don't want to leave where two players are, you know, angry at each other. You know, you want, that's, that goes back to listening and paying attention to what's really going on. And I'm, I made huge mistakes in this, in this area. Like, I just did sometimes I just didn't have my pulse on what was going on. And especially when coaching girls tennis, because, man, the girls are whole grudges against, yeah. each, against each other. The boys, y'all can fight, and five minutes later, you're best friends. Right? right? That's just the way guys are kind of wired in their head. We, we can tend to let go of things quicker and compartmentalize things, which is an advantage and a disadvantage. You know, because we don't feel as much sometimes. We don't feel the situation out. We're not sensitive to right. what's really happening. We're, we're too hard line, right? Girls really feel, you know. So if you're, good thing you're coaching the boys first. Yeah. It's good. Because so it's, it's a, you're a guy and you can kind of understand. Until I had kids that were, well, I have a, I have a daughter. And it, when she got that age, when she was a teenager, like all, like light bulbs went off on my head, I never knew were there. Because I was raising a 16 year old now. I know, or a 15 year old. I know exactly what you're thinking now. Because I got one at home. Yeah. Right? And, and typically, you know, we typically think along the same lines. There are outliers. You know, there are guys that are more sensitive. There are girls that more, are more compartmentalized. Right? So it's not a boy-girl thing, it's just a nature thing. It's yeah. a nurture thing. It's a reality, accept it for what it is, and understand that there, is, there, are, tr there are trends, and you know, there are ways that we act, and then there are outliers to that, and there are extremities to that, and not so. So there's, every, there's in between. Right. So you, just, you recognize things for reality, not for what you want them to be, but for what they are. Everybody wants to define things the way they think they should be defined. Well, some things are just, that's the way it is. And they just won't, don't want to accept. I want to get them. Some people just don't want to accept things as that's the way it is. Now, you may not, you may not want to believe it. You may want to form a cause over it. But the fact is that there's just certain things that are just facts, you know? And so you embrace that, and then you work with that. Is that do you understand yeah, what yeah. I'm saying? So the guys are, the guys are, are um, you can have issues with the guys, just like you'd have issues if you're coaching girls, but they're different issues. Um, and they're the same. They're the same, and then they're different. And you got to be able to determine, okay, what is that really? Um, so, so that's, that's kind of you know, where you want to start. Okay. And with, with what I just gave you, sort of the love, listen, learn, go into looking at your practices as that's the bulk of your time. Devote a lot of your energy in doing that, preparing that practice well, and then being flexible within it. And then that just prepares you for the matches. You show up for matches, it's match day, have some fun out there, compete, go hard. If they don't run down balls in practice, they're not going to run them down in match. Yeah. You know, you're, if you don't do something in practice, you will not do it in the match. And especially when you're dressed up and you're at another school and other people are watching and maybe your girlfriend came to watch you or whatever, and you're, or you're jacked up on Mountain Dew. I mean, <laughs> there's, all kinds of, there's all kinds of reasons why, or there's all kinds of, of, of reasons why pressure exists. But you've got to, you got to create, try to create that as close as you can during practice. Because that's going to make your team strong. Right? I think one of the things is with being younger, yes. I feel like the, the kids don't necessarily, you know, there's maybe not that initial respect type thing. Okay. So I guess creating an environment where you know, they are running down balls, where they can lead. Exactly. I don't, you know, not being oppressive or anything on them, but. Correct. 
enough but getting pressure. Them to, yes, to, enough pressure to get them to motivate. Yeah. To run the ball down. Right. Um, there's a little thing called peer pressure that really works well. And if you can get the players that are the ones that other players look up to, if you can get those players to buy into it, then the other ones will buy into it. Yeah. Because there's a lot of in in the in this world, there's a lot of there are a lot of followers and there are not so many leaders. Okay? There will always be more followers than leaders. Respect is earned over time. Right? right. Now, the gray hair does help. You know, yeah, when yeah. I was in my 20s and early 30s, when I was coaching you guys, I had gray hair. So it, that does help, right? Because they look at the gray hair, I go, dude, that dude's, dude's old. I better respect him. Yeah. Right? right? Yeah. So there's some of that. Yeah. I don't think there's as much today as there was 30 years ago. I think there's a lot more disrespect among young people yeah. towards adults. Um, and I think that a lot has to do with the culture and how much we how much we're, we can get to know because we can we can get on our phones and find it out really quick. So we, we get a lot of knowledge. Young people have a lot of knowledge and then they think they know it all. The problem is they fail to realize they don't have experience. You may know a lot more than me, but you sure as hell don't, you don't have as much experience as I do because I'm 49 and you are 21. 21. I'm, dude, I'm, you could be my kid, okay? Yeah. Literally, like I have a 19 year old. Okay, so literally, like I could be your dad, right? Because I'm old enough. Right. So I've experienced my 20s. Guess what? I've experienced my 30s. Guess what? I've experienced my 40s. So I'm like got three decades on your rear end, <laughs> right? And so you may know a lot more, but I got experience. And experience will always trump knowledge because anybody can learn anything if they apply themselves. But to go through an experience and come out blazing, saddles you know yeah, yeah to go through the fire and not be singed to be burnt to a crisp and yet be built back up that's that's a completely different situation it's it's not the situation that defines you it's what you do after the situation and, and as a result of the situation how do you live your life the next day okay yeah. it all went down on Sunday how are you gonna live on Monday I'm going to live on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? Are you going to be in the moment or are you going to be stuck in the past? Are you going to get stuck too far in the future? You know, you have to be thinking too much. Don't think too much about whether they're going to respect you. Hello, they're not going to respect you. Hello, some are going to respect you. Some are going to be in limbo. They're not sure whether they want to respect you or not. See, I'm just telling you the reality. So that's what's going to go down. Right. So now that you know that, now that now you can you can accept it for reality. Some are going to respect you. Some are going to be in limbo. They're going to be teetering, and it's going to all hinge on how you approach them in the beginning. And then some are just going to come out and go, Gordon. Gordon is coaching me. Yeah, I knew his little brother or his little brothers in my class. Whatever. Whatever. But but so. Um, how you prepare yourself is going to be the determining factor to winning winning as many over to the respect category, right? You may have a player that disrespects you the whole year. Now, obviously, if they're, if they're disrespecting you in front of the team, you have to have a sidebar, yeah. what I call a sidebar conversation. So you don't call them out in front of everybody. And this is the mistake I made. I would call people out in front of everybody. And that did more damage than good because I embarrassed them. It wasn't that I wasn't right. I was totally right and justified for calling them out. Right? Because right. they were being dingleberries. Okay? Yeah. I don't know if we can say that, but I guess we can. <laughs> but they were being just little shits. Right? Right. And I had every right to call them out. The problem with that is I created more of a wedge between me and that player 
and between me and the other players that maybe liked right. that, like were friends with them. Yeah. So I created more of a wedge than I created a good solid bridge for a relationship, for communication. And so I learned because I paid attention and I saw the repercussions and I saw, recognized the wedge I created, I had to backtrack. I had to go into backtracking and I had to go into strategic ways that I could build, the, take the wedge and build a bridge. And it took more time to build that bridge from tearing down the wedge and building the bridge than it was if I had just kept, held my tongue and called them to the side and had like a sidebar privately and go, you know, I understand, you know, that you, sometimes, you know, it's hard in practice. It's hard to, you know, respect the coach and it's hard to respect yourself. And just think, you know, have a conversation. And that I'd have built a bridge right then. And I wouldn't have to tear down anything. Yeah. Um, that, that's, it's these things that you have to think through when you're coaching. What's a high performance coach, in my opinion, is someone who can take someone that's a pure beginner or that is rebellious in their play and turn them around or take someone who just can't get it together mentally and emotionally and, and turn them around, right, and really teach skill in that context of mental, emotional, tactical, strategic, being able to in, handle the winning and losing and, right. and juggle that, right? You know, that's a high performance coach. Someone who can take somebody out of the, out of the fire and knows how to dust them off, and knows how to get them back where they're not jumping in the fire voluntarily. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, um, and that's all just from experience.